My name is Shelley Christensen, and I am honored to introduce Adana James this morning. Uh, before we get started, I would just like to uh, welcome all of you who are here in the room, as well as all of you uh, who are watching via Zoom, and I want to thank you for that. We will be monitoring the chat for questions. I ask you, please, just put questions and comments in the chat. There's um, anything that uh, actually, chat, anything in the chat does mess with the screen readers for those who use screen readers. So we ask you just to put only questions in that for the time being. And if you can even hold off during the presentation and wait until Adana is done with her presentation to put your questions in, that would be a great help to everyone. Or you could use, thank you, Lynn, or you could use the Q&A feature and put them in at any time. We appreciate that so much. And now let's get started. In 2020, Adana James was selected to be the Emerging Scholar Lecturer at the Institute on Theology and Disability, which 2020 came, 2020 when, came and went. And so we are so pleased that Adana will join us today as the Emerging Scholar for the Institute on Theology and Disability. And her, her title is Rejoicing Through a Communion of Vulnerabilities. Adana James, PhD, is a daughter, friend, sister, lover of life. She comes from the Caribbean, twin, state, twin island state of Trinidad and Tobago. And no, sorry about that little zoomy thing here. He now serves at the Seminary of St. John Vianney and the Uganda Martyrs in Trinidad. She also serves on the Bethesda TT Board, a ministry to families with people with disabilities and on the Secretariat of the Conference on Theology in the Caribbean today, or in Caribbean today. She's deeply committed to lived faith and has a passion for theology, spirituality, spirituality, ecology, community, dance, and food preparation. She remains ever hopeful in the possibilities of the divine here and now, and in the beauty of the world as is. Please join me in welcoming our 2020, 20, 21, and 22 emerging scholar. Adana, Adana James, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, because I have my slideshow already up, I'm having a little bit of difficulties in terms of, of seeing everyone at the same time. So I'm just hoping that I am being seen and heard. Yes. No. Well, because you're sharing screen, we can only see either you or your slides at the same time. So if you stop sharing your slides, then we can see you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, am I being heard? Okay, great. I'm sorry. So um, first of all, I just want to say how grateful I am for being part of the ITD this year. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers, to the founder, um, to the community of disability theologians, to the community of ITD generally. Um, to those who have joined us here live and online. Um, I'm really happy to be here, not in person, but still here. So thank you so much for that. And I think I'll just launch straight into what I'm presenting and what I'm about to share with you today. I tried my best to see how it could be accommodating 
but there may be instances where that may not fully happen. And, you know, I look forward to hearing from you in terms of how it could be improved going forward in this kind of environment. So I think I'll just, as I said, launch straight into it. So I'll go to my slideshow. And in the chat, you could just let me know, just make sure that I'm, it's, it's being seen. Yeah. Yes, we can see it, thank you. Okay, great. So I wanna begin by kind of giving you a little bit of background on what has made me present what I'm about to present. And I will also introduce a little bit about myself, but that's kind of part of the presentation. So I'll do that a little later. So before I go into the crux of what I'll be doing here today, I just want to share with you three thorns that have been digging into my flesh. And these are some of the scenarios that are behind what I'll be doing today. The first is Jean Vanier late Jean Vanier. We kind of don't know how to talk about all that has happened. So when I was first graciously offered this scholarship, it was named the Jean Vanier Emerging Scholar Award. It's been since renamed. And among the many fallouts from this, at least in the disability world, is that I find that the word vulnerability has also kind of fallen out, there's a little bit of discomfort there. We now no longer know what to do with this word. It's kind of been condemned a little bit. My second thorn, so to speak, comes from a conversation that I had with a friend last week that kind of highlights how I've been feeling about academia lately. One of them shared with me their frustration with a particular experience they had. Her husband was asked to share on a topic of national interest. And when he did so, and the organizers received it, he was asked to take everything out of it that was provocative, emotive, in short, everything that was honest. The topic of national interest that he was inv invited to share on was war. So my question was, how does one make war, violence, death, unprovocative and without emotion. And the third little thorn in my flesh is this whole pandemic experience and COVID. I don't think I need to say anything more. I'm still trying to process it, still trying to deal with all the realities that have come as a result of it. Um, but yeah, these, these are kind of what has prompted my presentation here today. My slides seem to have been stuck again, so I'm gonna stop. And I'm sorry about this. And I'm gonna try this one more time. So with the fallout of this JV scandal, the inauthenticity of, or a lack of integrity of academia and, and COVID kind of pressing into me. Um, at the same time, it's holding a bud, a bud of a rose that I think that I've come across and I would love to share with you. And I've kind of named it, as you see, rejoicing through this communion of vulnerabilities. So it comes from years of research on the topic of disability, combined with my experience over the past two years. So join me as I kind of share this budding poetics with you. It's a poetics, it's not a theory. 
it's a poetics. And I'll explain a little bit more about that, about communion and what this whole thing of communion of vulnerabilities is. Now, none of this makes any sense without me sharing a bit of who I am with you. So there's a colorful carnival character associated with my culture called the Perot Grenade. The Perot Grenade is a jester and he's usually dressed in a costume with layers of pieces of multicolored cloth. So this is how I'm coming to you today with these layers of multicolored cloth. So my name is Adana. As you would have heard, I'm a daughter, a sister, a friend, a companion. I am a Roman Catholic laywoman. I come from a small, very close-knit family with a sibling somewhere on that beautiful autism rainbow. And I come from the Caribbean. So I come from Trinidad and Tobago and the colors that people usually associate with my place, it involves sun and sea and sand. But then there are some shades in between that speak of a whole history, a people, a place, a culture. We have some of the smallest island states in this part of the world, and it's a place that holds a lot of vulnerability within it. A lot of times we have to prepare for hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. But there's also a lot of multiplicity in this space. We have a host of cultures here, all kinds of languages, Dutch, English, Spanish, French, other indigenous Creole languages like Papiamento and French Creole. We are descendants of many peoples, Amerindians, all kinds of Europeans, Africans, East Indians, Chinese, Syrian, Lebanese. And of course, there's always a lot of mystery surrounding our islands. We just have to look at pop culture and all this talk about the voodoo that takes place here. So why am I talking about all of this? Well, it's because it can appear to be all mixed up, confused and difficult, especially for outsiders to understand. It's kind of also hard for insiders to explain. But for the past four or five years, I've been exploring with a particular poet and philosopher from this part of the world. His name is Edward Gleason. And he believed that the thought of this space couldn't be summed up in theories or statements, but only through something he called a poetics. So what does that mean? It's not just about a collection of poems. For him, it's a system of thought, but one that could easily bend, twist, ravel and unravel and take in all kinds of things at once. It's not about confusion, but it takes in everything like kind of a dance. And when you see and use this kind of thought to express certain realities, like I used it for disability, I personally found it worked a little bit better. It wasn't hard and fast. It wasn't black and white. In fact, it was multicolored, producing all kinds of shades, even though most of those shades don't yet have a name. And for Gleason, he had a particular kind of poetics, which was known for its ability to capture sharings, any kind of shared spaces or shared realities, relationality, that kind of thing. The second thing this poetics was known for was capturing vulnerability. And the third thing it was known for was capturing something he called opacity which referred to anything that couldn't really be defined or logically explained. In fact, everything that defied explanation. Lastly, and this is where my, kind, my presentation kind of fits in today, this poetics had to involve the poet, him or herself. You kind of had to insert yourself in the work that you were doing. 
and in whatever it is you were reflecting on. So with this poetics, as opposed to a theory, I wanna to try to describe and to give language and kind of reclaim a little bit the language of vulnerability and its life-giving potential, especially when it comes to the topic of disability. And for me, I kind of see that life-giving potential as communion. So I wanna kind of use a life out of, a page, sorry, out of the life of, a page out of the book of the life that I've kind of been experiencing over the past two years. And I'm hoping that with it, you'll see what I mean and how I've come to this conclusion about the life-giving potential of vulnerability, how it leads to communion. Shared vulnerabilities. Vulnerability and the lone woman. So I'm going to be giving you some journal reflections now. March 2020. I move out, but the nation moves in. One week after I moved into my new apartment, the nation went into lockdown. Our country had one of the strictest lockdowns in the world. I was only able to outfit my place to the barest minimum, a bed, living room, refrigerator, stove. I had two pots, a couple of plates. It was me alone, nothing and no one else. I was alone, but not lonely. As time went on and we as a country thought we were doing really well, what we thought we had beat came back to kind of bite us hard here. The number of deaths kept rising. The virus was now out of our control and fear became more intense. And my calm started to turn into anxiety and then asked. Four walls began to kind of close in on me. And questions that I thought was long put away began to return. I was asking the same questions, but this time I was getting completely different answers. I had to ask myself, did I make a mistake with my life choices? Did I have any real future here? My chronic insomnia returned. And guess what? My newfound salary was now cut. May 2020. Mother's Day 2020, I went to visit my aunt. My aunt V is a complex case. She's elderly, paralyzed from a stroke she had years before. She lived alone in her apartment, no children, no husband, and estranged from what family she did have. I made several attempts to call her during the lockdown and never got through. No one knew what was going on with her. I got there and found a literal shut in. Her phone had stopped working. She had no TV, radio, internet. She lived on the third floor of her building and because of that semi-paralyzed state, she couldn't make it out on her own. She had one lone visitor, the person who brought her food every day. This was not a relative, but the person I met, my Aunt Ree, looked like a disoriented, mumbling, irrational woman who was afraid, alone, and depressed. I couldn't make sense of anything she was saying. She knew there was something called COVID, but she had no idea what this actually meant. She wanted to go to church, to be with familiar faces. You can't do that, I had to explain to her. She wanted to talk to someone, anyone. She had no contact with the outside world and the outside world had stopped bothering with her. We were all being told, stay away from the elderly. As for me, I couldn't draw too close. I was afraid. This is me, I thought. This, Adana, is your future. 
In my mind, I was being compared to her and I resented it. I said to myself, you must have made a mistake with this life choice. You convinced yourself it was God's will for you. One night in prayer, when I was praying about this, I heard these words, take care of her, take care of your aunt. I began to visit her more often than often turned into every day. I prepared breakfast, dinner, I helped prepare her bath, dress her, clean her, but I would also judge her. I said to myself, you were so selfish and greedy and that's why you're here now and you deserve this. I was cold in all my dealings with her. I did caring activities, but I didn't really care. One night I prayed again, God, help me to care. I started listening. I felt sorry. Then I decided to take her to the rest of my family. Not physically, I couldn't do that. I didn't even have a car. But I made her condition known to them and to others. I appealed to their humanity. I begged for support and well, for care. And slowly over time, it happened. Sometime after that, my aunt V fell and she hit her head and almost bled to death in that apartment by herself. She had to be hospitalized and eventually we took the decision to place her in a care home. Now there was a better support system for her. Her siblings agreed to help. They started caring again. With me as the buffer between everyone because the pain of past hurts was there, but with me there, it became less. With even stricter lockdowns now in place, however, and she was moved to the home, it meant no one was allowed to visit her for almost two years. She still had no phone. The home itself was being renovated and we couldn't reach them. And one day the head nurse called my home and uh, said to me, listen, Miss V is uncontrollable. Staff can't deal with her. A doctor was called in. She was diagnosed with some kind of psychosis. The next I knew she was medicated and for almost a year was totally out of it. April, 2020, vulnerability and the autistic. I don't know what again to do. This was the voice of my father who called me one night to let me know that he and my mom had moved out of the main house into the annex because they were afraid of contracted COVID from my brother. You see, as more and more elderly persons succumbed to COVID and as the restrictions grew more and more severe, the issue of my 42-year-old autistic brother not being able to adjust to the very fast and ever-changing demands of the new normal was more than they could bear. The stay-at-home order, the curfew, my brother not being able to go to church, to see family, partake in regular events for his birthday, Christmas, carnival, in other words, him not being able to follow his routine was traumatic for him and on the family home. Will he contract the virus when he's out and bring it home to my elderly parents? Will law enforcement understand why he's out? Will they arrest him, which they had the power to do during this time? My parents were at their end in terms of adopting strategies to help him deal with this reality. And both being in their 70s, quite honestly, they were tired. What to do, what to do. My father reached out to me. I started seeking out all available supports. None seemed prepared to deal with the autistic adult. We were on our own. My father decided to visit the local police. I offered to go with him. He was happy that I did that. We went with a letter and a photo of my brother explaining as best as we could what autism was in that letter and what my brother's daily routine was. As my father was climbing up the stairs to the station, he was stopped at the top. He began to explain to the officer that he saw there. 
the officer greeted us and immediately responded, oh, he's autistic. Yeah, I know about that. They stick to routines. How old is he? 42? Don't worry. Go inside and make sure every shift gets his photo. We look out for him. My father left the station a taller man that day. I returned two days later because I wasn't convinced that the police would do what they said. In fact, every night as curfew hit, I worried. I walked into the station. I explained who I was and why I was there. And the officer on, on duty immediately said, yes, we remember. We told you we look out for him. Don't worry. I left a lighter woman. This was not the reaction we were used to having, at least not when Chiron, my brother, was growing up. January 2021. As soon as the year turned, I WhatsApped one of my oldest friends. Happy New Year, I said. I got a message back from her. Dada has COVID. Dada is how she referred to her 80-year-old father who contracted COVID. Now, up until that time, the virus remained something real and scary, but very far away. I didn't personally know anyone who actually died from the virus, and this meant that I had a safe distance. If things got too overwhelming, I just switched off the news. I came off social media. This was my only access to the reality of this invisible threat. The message continued. But he's doing okay, my friend said. The next day, however, I got a message. He was moved to the high dependency unit. Me and my friend began a prayer journey together. One day, she just stopped hearing from her father and instead received doctor's updates. Each day, the situation worsened. Then she got the call from the hospital. Do we have your permission not to resuscitate? Yes, she said. Although he was a popular community activist and sexton at his Anglican church, he was unable to be visited by anyone in his dying moments. The night before he died, I waxed up my friend. We did what in our faith tradition is called the last rites together. Praying these prayers, just she and I. These first few COVID deaths that happened in my country happened amidst the strictest of rules. The body must go to a particular funeral home and then to cremate. There was to be no viewing of the body. On the day of his cremation, two persons were allowed. She went with the priest. They had a few minutes. They stood 20 feet or so away from the box coffin he was buried in. The days leading up to the send-off were a lot. Excuse me, I'm sorry. She said to me one day, you're the only family I have. Eventually, months later, she had a memorial. No casket, no body, just a photo. One night, as I led the ritual week, I read from that text in John where it spoke about the woman not being able to find the body. I understood this text for the first time. How traumatic it must have been 
not to be able to see the body. My friend later told me, however, I got to see him, you know. I'm so glad. He looked like he was sleeping. January 2022. A longtime friend of mine called me. She had finally found a suitable place for herself, her husband, and her three, well, three, four-year-olds. I think he was about to turn four. We met when I was doing my master's. I was so happy for her. She and her husband had just returned home to their home country and were now starting to get settled after making numerous attempts to live abroad. So this settling after so much instability and making the transition from student life to family living, I really shared her joy. February, 2022, I received a message from her. Please pray for us. We don't know what's happening. It looks like the threats may be serious and real this time. The government is saying something else, but I have to leave here. The prices of everything is going up. A few days later, I received the message. Russia invaded. The next few weeks, were one of the most heartbreaking experiences of my life this year. You see, I always found out the news before I saw it on TV. Like when the first bomb was dropped in West Ukraine. I remember receiving a message one day from her. Much like the message of my father, it said, what to do? I felt so helpless, so vulnerable, so useless. Her family was having to come to terms with separation. I've never had to do anything on my own, she said. Now I have to be strong. She eventually fled with child, leaving her husband behind. The hardest decision, she says, she's ever had to make. I rallied prayer support, which is all that I could really do. Everyone that I could think of and we were all praying the same song, including my friend. Before she fled, however, she sent me a message, which I still can't understand to this day. Thanks for the prayers. I feel so quiet now. I couldn't understand because this quiet was happening in the midst of bombs and sirens. So these stories, I'm hoping, are helping to highlight the vast number of experiences of vulnerability that we encounter in a lifetime. The arc for these experiences was my own vulnerability. You see, as a young single woman living on my own without traditional family, this is generally unsupported socially. It's a socially unaccepted life choice, at least here. So while the pandemic uncovered the darkest of possibilities that existed with such a life choice, feeling alone, lonely, vulnerable, anxious, unsafe, it pushed me to a place within myself that I had not yet accessed, though I always knew was there. Beyond my negative thoughts and demons, I came face to face with the presence of an other deep within. This presence was relating back to me as if it were genuinely another presence. When I emerged out of this, I had a sense of belonging and relationship, a sense of feeling eternally supported, embraced and loved, and I felt it push me back out of myself to others. I was still vulnerable, but with a strong sense of this vulnerability and belonging. The closest word that I can find to express what that experience was is communion. So spiritual writer Henry Nowen shared these sentiments. He said, 
The word that seems best to summarize the desire of the human heart is communion. So at this point, I'm just going to kind of stop sharing and I'll continue as I kind of put to an end the journal part of the reflections. So some spiritual writers and theologians, for instance, like Thomas Reynolds um, in his vulnerable communion, they believe that communion points to the deepest form of relating that we experience. It's the divine and the human, but it's also human beings with one another. This movement towards someone, I experienced this as a kind of push and pull factor. There's a powerful force that draws beings deep into each other, even when it's not being recognized. And I believe that this access to each other is made possible only through our vulnerabilities. The movement that draws deep within, I see, at least from these experiences, they also push back out. Each time it does that, it takes with it not just our vulnerability, but now a sense of belonging. As this force pushes back out, the spaces of relating become wider, stronger, somehow more supportive. And in these spaces, something new and different and concrete actually emerges. So that's the poetics that this time has helped me to observe. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. The extreme vulnerability experienced by my father, who was in that category of persons called most vulnerable. It was compounded by having an adult with autism living with him, still dependent on him for basic care. But this drew him out. I have no idea what made my father call me his daughter that night to let me know that he and my mom had decided to move out of the main house. I heard his exasperation. They genuinely did not know how to reason with their son about this danger. The next few days involved me making phone calls, doing research, reaching out to other families with persons with disabilities. It wasn't just about my dad's vulnerability. It became a vulnerability of the family, myself included. But this was all being driven by my brother's vulnerability, who just could not deal with this major change. In the absence of any other support system, it then became the police. This is how the net I'm talking about was widening. And this net, it wasn't a place of preventing any falls. It was a place of being there to catch those who fell. The police officers, they saw or angst, anxiety, and they moved out of themselves. They couldn't give any remedies themselves of how to help my brother. They were not skilled in that way. What they offered was the assurance that they would let him be. Now, this was a decision taken against the instructions sent out to all police by the Ministry of National Security. In other words, they too were vulnerable but they moved outward to us. An entire station became aware of the reality of the pandemic upon our family. In the meantime, I hit the streets to all my brother's regular haunts because he was a person that walked and just went to visit neighbors. He made friends with people on the street. One by one, persons I met, some for the first time, let me know, listen, we're all looking out for him. Working together with my family and the police, they were all supporting my brother's vulnerability. My brother's vulnerability remained, but supported. I believed he belonged. We belonged. Now remember, I said something new emerges in these spaces, 
a bit of a miracle happened that is still unfolding and can't yet fully be explained. Chiron, my brother, was changing before our eyes. While some of his go-to responses continued, others were coming to the surface that non-pandemic eyes prevented us from seeing. I now believe that because of all the reinforcements the family received by the wider community, it helped to make an impact on my brother's behavior, which before then we believed was unchangeable. For more than a decade, my brother had a set routine. Although he doesn't work, his everyday routine means him going to the neighborhood park, and then he would return home at a specific time, no later, no earlier. During the pandemic, this time of coming home remained, and my parents believed that his routine never changed until my dad, in conversing and speaking about his frustrations with the neighbor, discovered from my neighbor that my brother, who spoke very little, was actually returning at the time of curfew, but that he would sit on another neighbor's front step until his specific time for getting into the house. This was an amazingly humbling experience, as my father, who until then had been quite punitive with my brother, in the hope that this would change his behavior, was forced to see the maturity and growth my brother was experiencing on his own. My brother was also developing new forms of communication beyond the usual tantrum. Writing became one of these, as he would create his own rules and instructions when he had trouble accepting my parents' own. It was as if a new man was emerging. Now, if this particular experience shows anything to me at all, it's the active and very powerful force that vulnerability is and how it is able to produce communion. And this movement of beings toward each other and back out to include others and a movement that produces new realities is what I've come to conclude about all this. This is not some heavenly, miraculous experience that is devoid of concrete effort. One thing that came out of this was that in my capacity as a theology lecturer, I decided to include a component of my course on justice. And I encouraged my students to engage with families of persons with disabilities as a group assignment. That group consisted mostly of parents of adults with autism. The group began sharing with one another the challenges, but also the joys of this time. It included their vulnerabilities, but also they were sharing their personal coping strategies, eventually becoming a support group. This was driven largely by my experience of not being able to get the type of support I felt I needed for my autistic brother during this time. The group has since stopped meeting, but the relationships continue. I've remained close friends with one of these mothers who I now assist in getting to and from church with her son. She sees my vulnerability too, so she often sends me very supportive messages and sometimes even chop the cake. The net keeps expanding. And there's this desire to share the insights that we've gained in that support group with a wider ministry um, and eventually with the larger faith community, which we're working on trying to get done. So I'm gonna share another quote with you from a spiritual theologian, Henry Nowen goes something like this. Jesus didn't say, blessed are those who care for the poor. He said, blessed are we when we are poor, when we are broken. It is there that God loves us deeply and pulls us into deeper communion with himself. So just a disclaimer, what I presented may seem like some romantic version of vulnerability. I want to stress there's an ever-present violence that comes with the force of vulnerability, especially 
when it's violently resisted. When we fail to move in the direction of the darkness that vulnerability pushes us to, our fear of this darkness can actually lead to very destructive and harmful behavior. For instance, when I described my journey there, just in a few sentences, I spoke about going deeper and deeper into myself, which was scary and could not have taken place if I didn't have certain supports. Because each time I was forced in, I was also forced back out where I developed the supports and got more supports to go to those deeper, darker areas of myself. Friends, therapists, my own fate life, these all served as that net to buffer my fall. In some cases, unbeknownst to me, I was forming part of a support system for others. However, my resistance to my own vulnerability and moving in that direction kept me from relating with my aunt in a proper way. My relating became very harmful. I was cold and judgmental in my dealings with her, even though I was doing activities that appeared to be caring. The guilt I felt at the way I reacted pushed me back into myself, but then it pushed me out again. The movement back out this time became less cold until eventually over months, it became actual care. And with this, I come to an important part of my journey of discovery. And I'm going to start wrapping up because I think I may be going over time here. That to care without being vulnerable is not to care at all. To care without being vulnerable is not to care at all. So for those of us who will engage in caring practices with persons with disabilities, we have to ask important questions to ourselves. Am I moving in the direction of my vulnerability or am I resisting it? I pray we have the courage to answer honestly. I didn't get to speak about the rejoicing part of things, but I'll just leave with a little quote that I'm hoping that can help you to understand why I named this rejoicing through our vulnerabilities. The Greek origins of this word, it's not about celebration. It's about being favorably disposed to God's grace. And this is the rejoicing that I believe I experienced, that being favorably exposed, disposed to God's grace enables us to see those new and beautiful things that are happening. And so this is what I want to leave with you today. I'm hoping that we can engage somehow on this. This is me. Thank you for listening so much. If there are any questions, I, I don't know if I have to go to the, to the chat to look for these questions or um, will people ask questions there? I'm not sure how this goes, sorry. Adana, this is Shelly. Thank, Thank you so much. I'm so moved and touched by sharing such a vulnerable time. And it, it, I don't know if you graduated from being an emerging scholar today to being an exceptionally powerful mm -hmm. speaker and scholar. Um, my question is what's, what's do you see as next for you? And then we also have questions here, Q and A. So we'll get to those in one moment. Thank you, Shelley, for your kind words. <laughs> um, what's next for me? I'm taking a little bit of a pause from the kind of 
academia that I was used to. And I'm going to be spending a lot of time, I believe, doing a lot more writing and personal reflecting. I want to see if there is a way to bring this, all of this, into an academic space. Um, I, I really believe that this is what we need to do if we are to be authentic to the experiences of disability that are in our lives. Thank you. We have a question now from Bill Gaventa. Say more about the violence that can accompany our invitation to vulnerability or experience of it. I don't know. I think there's a natural tendency towards self-preservation. And I think vulnerability continuously leads us to death. And I think that fight within us is always there to fight against where this death is actually leading us. And I think that resistance is what creates that violence. And violence may not always be a necessarily a physical lashing out. I, in my relationship with my aunt, is always crucial for me. I was not physically violent, but that indifference, that coldness, that deep down distance is what I felt was quite violent. And I don't know if that helps to answer the question. It's something that I'm still thinking about myself, but I, I believe that that's where it comes from. Questions here. Hi, we just have another comment from online from Cindy Valdir de Young. Adana, this is a very meaningful presentation. I will ponder this for some time. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't know if, uh, my name is Melissa, um, she, her, hers. I don't know if this will make a whole lot of sense, but I'm hearing echoes in your story of um, a dynamic, uh, I feel like caregivers can go through um, where you feel responsible um, and inadequate for the need. Um, you feel called to a piece of important work, you see the need and you feel, I guess you feel your own vulnerability, um, your own powerlessness um, in trying to, in being incapable of turning away from the need, but also not being able to fill it. And I feel like there's a moment of like a breaking point that can happen. And it sounds like in your story, you were able to turn outwards. Whereas I think some people we turn inwards and we can um, be violent towards ourselves um, or develop a resentment. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm, this is not a very scholarly response, um, but I think in terms of thinking about healing and thinking about our limitation as human beings and that um, being able to turn outwards and to find supports and a net waiting um, or at least a net that can be woven is it's such a doesn't always happen that way. I'm so glad that it did in these cases. And I, I hope there's some way that we can encourage one another to tell our stories about the last two and a half, three years and try to recognize the patterns because I do think there's still a lot of 
anger and sadness and um, pain turn inwards and the mental health issues we see now. And uh, I think by telling stories, maybe we feel less alone um, in our processing. That's it. I don't know if there's a question in there. Thanks so much, Melissa. I really appreciate your comment and your contribution. It's so true. A lot of what you're thinking, I'm thinking of it too. I like what you said. That last part is very encouraging to me personally, um, telling our stories, especially of these last two years. You know, there was a tendency, at least here, um, when things opened back up, everybody just went right back, you know? Um, kind of going back to, or at least trying to get back to where they were before 2020, right? And um, I think that's a great violence, you know, that we're doing to ourselves. I also like how you spoke about this tendency to feel we're alone. I didn't mention it, but it did come up when I look back at this, that there is a part of our vulnerability that kind of is deceptive. It makes us feel that we are alone in what we're doing. Um, but I also had a lot of support and I am also very conscious of persons who are going through very similar vulnerabilities and don't have that support. I haven't yet thought about answers for that. I don't think it's about answers, but I definitely believe that telling our stories is some kind of key to unlock some of this. So thanks for that, Melissa. Thank you, Adana. We have just a, we have several more comments and questions in our in our uh, space here in the chapel. I wanted to share just a couple of comments, and I know people in the in this space can't see them. Adana, I wanted to just call them out for you. Um, from I, I'm going to guess S. Ricar, I hope I can help. Sharon, hi Sharon. Sherry, hi Sherry. Thank you. Beautiful presentation. This touched me personally and professionally as I age with aging parents as a caregiver. From Holly Holt Wool, powerful vulnerability, powerful words, powerful experience, powerful witness, powerful presentation. Thank you. Alan Jorgensen wrote, thank you for this beautiful and powerful presentation. It is such a moving invitation to enter in community differently. And David Gaze, thank you for being so personal and sharing your deep vulnerability. Tom Jones, good insights into how sharing vulnerability can lead to communion with others and God. And please, so, oh, Keith. Hello. Please. Hi, Diana. Thanks so much for joining us today. And it was uh, really lovely to, to hear your talk and just for you to share your experience with us. And I appreciate it so much. Uh, hopefully you can join us uh, in Dallas next year in person. We'd love to, to have you here in this community. Um, so one thing over this past week, I've eaten a lot of ice cream and custard, frozen custard, which is different, apparently. Um, and it has been a lot of fun. It's just been a, it's been a lot of moments of joy this week. And, um, and so I want to give you some opportunity to talk a bit to the joy. And I'll share a couple of things. Um, one is, uh, and not to put Mark on the spot, but um, Mark shared that one of the markers of belonging for him is to be in a space where you know you can have fun, you can tease each other, and that really resonated with me. Just that that marker of belonging and being able to have fun in that way. Um, another thing that stands out to me, uh, and I checked with Chantel to to be able to share this, but um, just how in experiences of care, something like eating ice cream um, is just so uh, so enjoyable on its own. But in a, in a care environment where you're working with someone else to uh, enjoy ice cream, it becomes almost, almost a different experience. It becomes a relational experience. And we've talked a bit about the, 
um, the choreography of care, the choreography of embodiment. Uh, and so that's something that struck me this, this week, how something is as simple and as joyful as ice cream can become a whole experience in community when you, when you share that. Uh, and and uh, it's just been so beautiful to, to be witness to that this week. So I wanted to turn it back to you to just ask, can you tell us a bit more about whether it's humor or um, joy, uh, which we've, we've touched on a number of times this week as well. Uh, what, does, what does that look like, whether it's in your own experience or in, in the research that you've done? Um, can you give us a, a picture into that? Thank you. Shocking. I don't know what flavor custard you had, but <laughs> depending on the flavor, it can bring you more joy than others. Um, that is so uh, crucial. I didn't go much into that in this actual presentation because I, I wanted to try to really go deeply into the vulnerability aspect of it. Um, I think that laughter is, is really a wonderful sign of that disposal to God's grace in the midst of everything, that, that everything is still the same, but we can laugh. When my friend sent me that message, my friend who was in Ukraine, that she's so quiet now and she was so thankful. I couldn't understand it, you know? Um, so this is not your, your typical ice cream joy, but I, I, I still cannot for this day understand what she was talking about. Um, since then, however, we continue to speak and I mean, we laugh, <laughs> we, we share jokes, you know, um, and that points to a level of comfort in our own vulnerability. I spoke about my, my brother as well, who started using these very new strategies during this time. So when my parents would put up something like, stay at home, he would put, go out, you know, something like that, you know, it, it was just really funny what he would do during this time. And um, when we met together as a group of adults dealing with adults with autism, um, there were some persons who were just looking at my mother and they were saying to her, how could you be, how could you just be laughing during this time? You know, she's like, you know, he's hilarious. <laughs> really, he is. Um, so yeah, I, I think that laughter is, is where, when we get really comfortable with being vulnerable with one another, and, and we can do that, you know, so thanks for bringing that up. I think in the future, I think I'll probably have to spend a lot more time dealing with this, you know. We have a question from Amy Kenny. Thank you, Adana, for this powerfully vulnerable presentation. I would love to learn more about how we can bring this into academic spaces. There seems to be a distinction between disability theology and personal narrative of disability experiences with God. But what theology is not personal? How can we help folks understand that personal narrative of disability is theology? Thank you, Amy. Work with me, help me do it. <laughs> I um I, I don't think there's there's any going back anymore. Um I think that disability theology has actually provided a fantastic platform for being able to do just this, for being able to bring our narratives into that space of theology. In fact, this space at ITD is I think created just for that purpose. And um, you really have to look at the amazing foresight of the founders who came up with a space like this. And also having those spaces with persons who have disabilities and persons without having those common spaces, I think forces us to remain grounded as well. Um, but I think that, that disability theology has a lot to offer to academia generally. Because as I said in, in my sharing, how does one speak about topics like war and not expect to bring a certain level of, of feeling and, and emotion into this? So it does a lot of 
damage, violence to academia when we take our lives out of it, I believe. Thank you. Uh, we need to we need to conclude this session, unfortunately. And I, um, Justin, had put a good question, a wonderful question in the chat. Justin, if you can reach out to Adana, that would be probably the next, the closest we can come to answering it here in person. Adana, thank you again so much for your wisdom sharing your story and i'm i'm really excited to meet you in person <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, you all so much and thank you all for attending thank you so much thank you so much for this space and this opportunity i'm very grateful and i would love to meet you guys all <laughs>